are here today with Lydia Lace, who is running for county council. I cannot wait to kind of dive in and just help other people get to know who you are and why you are the candidate. So let's just start, you know, we're gonna take it, we're gonna go in a deep dive. So tell me a little bit about how your childhood or growing up influenced and led you kind of to this spot. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I mean, gosh, a lot of different things. Our childhood is such a long time, but uh, I was raised uh, almost entirely in Edinburgh and grew up there. My dad was a history professor at Edinburgh and my mom was a social worker, is a social worker uh, down in Meadville. And so I definitely had uh, a lens of both knowing your history, knowing the context of the spaces you occupy and, and the power dynamics at play, uh, but also as a, with that social work parent, you know, you have the helping people at, at every turn possible. And, and to combine the two uh, in, in my childhood, you know, was, was really powerful in, in kind of shaping my perspective of not only the world, but my role within the world and what my responsibility is uh, to do good where I can. Uh, I also have a younger sister. Uh, hi, Izzy, <laughs> if you're watching. I don't know if she'll watch this. Um, but she, uh, in grade school, was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes, which is the kind that you can't cure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so from a very young age, I became more acutely aware of, of the healthcare systems and the complexities there. But it really um, wasn't until I was in college and my dad was diagnosed with cancer and, and then subsequently died before I graduated. But um, seeing both he and then after his death, my sister no longer had his healthcare coverage, which he had amazing healthcare coverage due to the fact that he was a professor with a great union. Um, but seeing her then struggle with the healthcare system and all the barriers that she's had to face, um, you know, I saw even in my personal life the ways in which systemic barriers made individual issues sometimes almost impossible to overcome, but we were always treated as if it was like a personal issue, that it was like, mm -hmm. it, that was her issue to deal with and it wasn't any, but the reality was she never chose to have diabetes. She never chose to have this, this barrier, this disability. And yet here she was facing sometimes insurmountable odds, insurance companies telling her that her medication that was life-saving equipment and medication was not life, like wasn't necessary, it was a luxury item. And so, so seeing that happen um, from an early age and, and then, Subsequently, throughout my life, it's, it's been a series of kind of that same theme again and again. So whether I was working with previously incarcerated men re-entering into society and seeing the insurmountable barriers that they were facing and, and the cultural norms and, and systemic barriers that kind of led them down that path of, of criminal behavior or of, of, of this, the situations that brought them into the criminal legal system to begin with. Um, and so then again, seeing kind of the, the way the systems that were meant to create safety, meant to support the community, were actually putting these men at higher risk, right? They were making finding a house more difficult, finding a job more difficult, um, accessing community and social supports more difficult. Uh, and so, so then I saw the ways in which our systems were not supporting these families because at the end of the day whether they were incarcerated or not they still had families they still had parents that cared about them they still had sisters and brothers and wives and children and so to see them navigate that was just another reminder and then and I know I'm kind of getting outside of childhood forgive me for going off well, on I a think tangent. you're doing exactly where you need to go absolutely. Um, but then going and being a trauma therapist to children and teens in um, in Crawford County I saw ways in which our education system was not meeting the needs of kids. And it wasn't for lack of caring people. Like there were so many caring staff members and people in these systems, but they were again given like insurmountable barriers to have to teach this group of kids and deal with severely traumatized children that have such specific needs. And, and these systems just were not set up again. Like it was systemic barriers that were preventing these people from reaching their fullest potential. And so, so seeing that with, with the kids I was working with. And then now I'm a social worker working with, with refugees and immigrants in the city of Erie. And so I'm seeing again how our systems are just not made for certain people. And then we treat it as if it's their fault for not being able to succeed when these systems were just not made for them. And, and we, I just see this again and again. And so um, 
So that's really, in a long-winded way, how I, I came to see the almost like life or death need for people to advocate at a systemic policy level for these, these changes and these policies that protect people and actually are based in the realities of people's lives. I saw so many times where policymakers would pass a, a decision that then in their efforts and in their wording, it was all about helping people and then seeing it trickle down to the, the ground level where the people were at, where I was picking up the pieces of people's lives with them after severe trauma and it was hurting them even more. And so to bring that experience, to bring that knowledge of, of what that looks like on the ground level, I think is something um, is, is powerful and it's, it's why I'm doing this um, because I've, I've seen our shortcomings. I've also seen how amazing we are. I've seen us at our most resilient. I've seen kids that experience such hor horrific traumas be able to come back and have such beautiful views of themselves in the world despite all the odds. And, and so I, I know what we're capable of. I know what, what we could accomplish if just given the space and time and resources to do so. I think that, that this leads me to like the next, this beautiful segue um, is you use the word systems and barriers and trauma. And one area that I've seen you become pretty vocal on is, is just some of the things that are happening right now in the prison. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe walk us through a little bit of like using those same, like how the, those systems and those barriers play out in, the, in what you've been most active on about the prison right now. Yeah, absolutely. So in our Erie County prison system, for people that don't know, um, there's a specific policy called the so-called cost recovery program. Um, it's a really nice way of talking about something that's really not nice at all. And, and the policy basically ensures that the families of incarcerated folks have to pay twice as much to get their family members like the most basic items. So hypothetically, like say your glasses break tomorrow and you're in, in Erie County Prison and I wanna send you a hundred bucks for a new pair of glasses that you have to go get an eye exam for so it costs you a hundred bucks. So I wanna send that to you, but the Erie County Prison takes 50% of that just because they, they say they're doing it for behavior modification. So they take 50% of that. So now if I actually want to get you enough money to get your glasses, I have to pay twice as much. So it's, it's not hurting the people on the inside, it's hurting the families on the outside because they're losing even more money. And they say it's for behavior modification, but as like a trauma therapist and a social worker, I can tell you that's not a healthy behavior modification tool. Uh, I mean, I, I, it, it feels almost akin to using a weapon to modify someone's behavior, like threatening someone in order to get them to do what you think is right is not the healthy ethical way to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we're, we're capable of so much better than that. And so, so I really think that that is just one example of many that our policies don't reflect the research, they don't reflect the, the intentions, and they don't reflect the, the positive, progressive change that people are capable of. I truly believe that people are capable of change and that that, that we are capable of so much more than, than we're actually doing right now. And it's because we have policies like this that just are, are not helpful. They're actively holding people back. They're actively creating class inequality for people who have family members that they care about that are in our Erie County prison system. And the reality is, is these aren't outsiders. You know, I, having worked with men who were previously incarcerated, we tend to talk about the prison system as if it's populated by people that aren't from our community that it's like us and then them. And they just showed up out of the shadows and now they're here and now we have to like lock them up. But that's not it. Uh, the people that are locked up in Erie County Prison are our neighbors, are our family members, are our friends. They are the, the man that we used to see every day walking down, like they are, they are people that were part of our community that people in our community still care about. And so the moment we stop dehumanizing these people, I think we will be so much better for it and we will be able to capitalize on such amazing potential that we have locked away and that we have been stealing from, from the families. So I, this is just another long-winded way of saying, I think that there are many policies in which if we just changed one piece of it, if we just stopped stealing money from the families of incarcerated folks, we would see a lot more potential and a lot more growth in our community because we would not be stealing from people anymore. So 
with, with the lived experiences that you've had, your professional experience that you've had, how does this all come together to make you like the, the candidate or to, to like help you in this seat? So just kind of like, I guess, expand on, on, on how you think that this, that why you, why you? Yeah, so, cause I've seen it and I've heard it and I, I've, I've experienced it. So whether I'm talking about personal experience, but I think more importantly, my professional experience as a trauma therapist, I don't talk about the light fluffy stuff. I don't you know, just talk to you like I would at the grocery store in the checkout line. Like we get down to the nitty gritty of people's lives and what it looks like on a daily basis, sometimes during the, the worst, hardest moments of their life. So when I talk about my experiences and knowledge of people's lives, I, like I have probably the most intimate knowledge of people's lives that you could possibly have for some people because they're talking to me about some of the most horrific things that have happened and how they're coping with it and, and, how, and their hopes for the future and, and their fears and, and their dreams. And so to take that knowledge and such depth of knowledge of people, I can bring those perspectives. I can carry those, those experiences with me to counsel in a way that no one else is and no one else can. Mm -hmm. um, that, and I hope that I'm not the only person that does this. Like I hope we see more helpers reaching out and, and seeking political office and seeking systemic policy level change because I think that that's really powerful. But I can bring the knowledge of, of what life looks like on the ground. You know, I'm not sitting up in like some ivory tower looking down at people or I, you know, only have experience from a, a business perspective. I see people for their lives, for their humanity. I've talked to uh, a young girl who had to process what it meant to see a parent overdose and how to process what it feels like when you don't know if your caregiver can take care of you anymore. And I've talked to teenagers about what it means to lose a friend to gun violence. And I've talked to incarcerated men about what it means to, to be treated like a monster when you feel like you're a good person. I've talked to refugees and immigrants about what it means to feel like an outsider or to feel like no one's going to give you a chance or take you seriously because you can't speak perfect English. So I know what barriers are facing people. I know what it looks like to be in court mandated therapy and not have transportation access to go to your therapist's office and really want to go get treatment, but not have the means to do so and then get docked by your probation officer for not going to treatment. Like I know how these barriers just keep piling on top of people countless times. And so that knowledge and experience are, are what I will bring, not only to the decisions I make, but then to the, the questions I'm asking and the policies that I'm going to promote and encourage because at the end of the day, whether I'm working as a social worker or as, as some political person, my dream is to, to leave the world better than I've found it, right? To, to, to leave it in a place where they don't need me, mm -hmm. right? I, ideally, if I'm doing my job right as a social worker or therapist, I'm, I work myself out of a job that eventually I will have done enough preventative work that people aren't being traumatized in the way that they need my help. And similarly, I feel like if, if I've done my political job right, I've created policies and spaces in which equitable decisions are just inherently happening because we put the right structures in place to protect people's rights and to ensure equitable access and transparency and accountability. Um, and so hopefully I don't have to stay in this forever. And that's, I don't want to, mm -hmm. but I want to make it better so that I can stop picking up the pieces of people's lives for things that are entirely outside of their control. Those are, I think, some deep, profound answers. And I'm curious, you know, we've gone through this, this, this journey with you just right now. How do you wind it down? Like, where's your favorite spot or your favorite self-care activity um, or a space that you would recommend that, you know, somebody who just needs a little, like, debrief time go? Oh, my gosh. Well, I love Edinburgh and Washington Township, where I live. Um, and so my favorite spot to go is to go for a walk around Edinburgh's campus and to stop by Dairy Supreme on our way. <laughs> I'm not sponsored by Dairy Supreme, but I could be. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I love going, getting like a chocolate malt from Dairy Supreme and then walking around town like you said, you know, just for the fresh air and, and to see people that you know, like there's nothing more exciting than walking down the street and like seeing someone you know. And that's the beauty of so many of our, our small towns and our rural pockets of the county is that you really know the people in your neighborhood and you know the people that, that you interact with. And, um, and I love to enjoy that and embrace that. Love it. 
Lydia, if, if somebody wants to learn more about you and your candidacy, where can mm -hmm. they check you out? Oh, well, <laughs> you can uh, follow me on Facebook and Instagram at, at electlydialaith, and you can email me at electlydialaith at gmail.com. Mm -hmm.